Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, thank you, Governor Doug Burgum and Rich Carlgaard for being our honored guest today here for our program, Returning to the New Normal, Insights from Governor Doug Burgum, sponsored by our firm, March Capital Partners. Over the past few weeks, we've hosted a series of discussions sharing insights from business and government leaders on the evolving situation and what life should and could resemble post pandemic. The current economic and public health crisis has dramatically changed the way business in America will be conducted, how technology is being deployed and utilized to support distributed workforces and how economic development work will occur across the broader geography of America. And today we're pleased to host a discussion between Doug Burgum, the Honorable Doug Burgum, Governor of North Dakota, and Rich Collard from Forbes Media. Governor Burgum is widely viewed as the most experienced and successful entrepreneur and tech investor to currently hold a political leadership position in the United States. Prior to taking office as the 33rd governor in North Dakota in December 2016, Governor Burgum was the founder and CEO of Great Plains Software, acquired by Microsoft after a successful IPO, former chairman of Atlassian, uh, now um, NASDAQ listed $50 billion approximate company, director and seed investor in success factors, and he also founded the Kilbourne Group, a real estate development firm committed to creating smart, healthy cities through vibrant downtowns and co-founded co -founded Arthur Ventures, a venture capital firm. He grew up in Arthur, North Dakota, graduated from North Dakota State and ended his MBA at the Stanford School of Business. So you can see here from this image that his career spanned from his office atop the Fargo Theater in Fargo to being chairman of Atlassian in Sydney. But as governor, he brings a businessman's approach or business leaders approach to diversifying the economy, creating the 21st century jobs, revitalizing main streets. And since taking office, he's charted a course for North Dakota rooted in innovation and reinventing government to be more efficient. In response to taxpayers to empower people, improve lives and inspire success. So you just take one example of that is how they become a leader in broadband. Uh, it's an extraordinary story and one that we'll touch on today in the interview. Now, it's not all about broadband and you know, North Dakota. Most people say they haven't been to North Dakota, but it's a beautiful state and our number one producer of honey. And one ranking we saw yesterday is the best state in the country for millennials from Millennial Magazine. Um, we had a long debate at that last night with my kids, Doug, but so I'm bringing them with me. And oil production number two after Texas in the United States. There's a lot to it. Now, uh, we looked long and hard to find any critical comments on Doug. The only thing we could find was a B from the Libertarian Party, which thought he should have moved more quickly to open up the economy. But I think getting a B from the Libertarians is about all you want. It, governor Burgum was one of the first governors to really effectively open up his economy in a thoughtful and deliberate way. North Dakota went about it, provides some lessons for all of us, and he'll share and explore those today with Rich. Now, interviewing him today is another North Dakota native, Rich Carlgaard. Rich is the editor of large and a futurist for Forbes Media, formerly Forbes Magazine, and the author of several books, including Life 2.0, which predicted the future efficacy and prevalence of remote work, where he flew across uh, to North Dakota regularly in his Pilatus aircraft there on the cover. He's also the author of several other books in week, uh, bi-weekly columns in Forbes, and a good friend and an excellent journalist. journalist. And again, thank you for joining us today. I'll turn it over to um, uh, Rich to start the interview, and I'll join you later for the uh, Q&A sessions. Thank you. Governor Burgum, it's great to see you again. Uh, for the audience, uh, I last saw the governor in Fargo, North Dakota in February, and the North Dakota economy was, was booming. Um, before we get to the, the booming North Dakota economy and then the how you're managing the reopening of the North Dakota economy and where you expect it to go, um, just a couple of questions that I think are always fun. Uh, you, you did go to Stanford Business School and you met Steve Ballmer there. And you eventually, after taking Great Plains Public in 1997, you answered uh, Steve's call and uh, negotiated a sale. What, what was your relationship like with Steve Ballmer over that period? Well, Steve's an incredible leader and got, as everybody knows, incredible energy and incredibly competitive. And uh, he's one of the reasons why Microsoft became, became Microsoft. Uh, and uh, he and I were uh, having a discussion in 1983. I was thinking about literally 
betting the farm on a software startup in North Dakota, Great Plains. Uh, my dad had passed away in high school and the only seed capital I had was a quarter section of farmland. And so I was getting ready to mortgage that and put it into Great Plains. Uh, people, though, 1983, spring of 83, didn't even know what a software company was in North Dakota. I called Steve, my friend uh, from grad school, and I said, look, Microsoft, you guys are huge. You have a couple hundred employees. Uh, I want to make sure if I'm getting into this business, we're not going to get crushed by some giant company that's got 200 employees. And Steve said, uh, basically, over my dead body, we'll never be in that space. Uh, and then in 2000, we've been a public company for over four years. And Steve called and said, hey, uh, remember that conversation we had at uh, Comdex in 1983? Uh, we're ready to revisit that question. And we'd like to visit with you. And so that, that began a uh, long negotiation of some uh, two no's and a yes. And uh, we were excited to have uh, all 2,000 Great Plains software team members become a new division of Microsoft. And of course, as they say, the rest is history. Well, after the Microsoft purchase, you stayed at Microsoft for five years. Is that correct? Seven, seven years. Seven years. And during those seven years, um, tell us about uh, your relationship with Satya Nadella. Well, Satya was, was uh, at Microsoft at the time that we were acquired. And there was a, of course, the dot-com bust happened shortly after that. He was one of the people that was an internal, and an internal group of about 400 people at Microsoft that had started a, a, a group called B Central, which was a, a dot-com startup within Microsoft. And that got merged into uh, Great Plains shortly after we acquired. And uh, it turned out that the uh, best asset in all of B Central was Satya Nadella. And uh, he and I had a great working relationship. He led the R&D for the Microsoft Business Solutions Group, which I led. Uh, so he was a direct report of mine for nearly the entire, uh, all the, virtually all the seven years that I was at Microsoft. Well, you taught him, uh, you taught him well. I have to think he's the, the be uh, yeah, at least in the top five of all CEOs in the world. One more question on your business and investing curve before we move on to your tenure as governor and, and now dealing with this corona crisis is how the heck did somebody in Fargo get to be a early investor and then eventually chair chairman of the board of Atlassian in Sydney, Australia? Well, the, the credit on that all goes to uh, Scott Farquhar and Michael Cannon Brooks, the two amazing founders of Atlassian. Uh, they had started that uh, incredible business uh, with their amazing business model to you know, help, help with tools to help people write better software faster, which is something the world definitely needs right now. And those uh, two young guys didn't have a board and they were trying to start a board. And I got a cold call from Scott Farquhar uh, and he said, we're looking for somebody who has chaired a public company, someone who started as an entrepreneur when they were really young and stayed with it for m multiple decades. Uh, and grew it to scale, someone who's taken company public, uh, somebody who knows how to build and share a board. Uh, and I actually said to them in that conversation, I said, well, have you, have you talked to Scott Cook? Because I was thinking of Scott, the founder of Intuit, as someone that fit all that criteria. And then, and then Scott Parkour said, oh, yes, there's one more criteria. We're looking for someone who did it outside of Silicon Valley. And of course, uh, they were wanting to continue to headquarter their company in their home country. Uh, and so I said, I actually, I don't know anybody that fits that criteria. And then he said, except for you, uh, that began a relationship uh, where I had an opportunity uh, to help, help form the board, help, help, uh, help Scott and Mike grow as leaders. They were great leaders, but I really enjoyed the opportunity working with them, build their team, and eventually a very successful IPO. And now they're, you know, been a super successful public company. Well, I have to believe that uh, your run for governor of North Dakota might have been the most personally expensive run in the history of state politics because you stepped down as chairman of Atlassian <laughs> in the fall of 2016. But uh, what, what did persuade you to, um, to throw your hat in the ring and run the quixotic campaign that you did? Well, I, I think for people that know me know that I, lo I love North Dakota. I love the people of North Dakota. I love the the, the, the geography and the resource of North Dakota. Uh, and I, it, it just, it's given so much to me. And it's one of these things where you said, hey, if I was, I was looking at it, I think in an analytical way, I was looking at, had been doing philanthropy uh, for uh, a couple of decades in North Dakota and trying to, trying to move the dial on a number of important issues. And then you look at uh, the size and scale of government and the impact it can have. On, on things that matter to all of us and future generations, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's economic development, uh, whether it's helping individuals reach their fullest potential. And I said, hey, if I'm gonna pour this time and energy 
uh, into trying to make North Dakota a better place, the point of higher, highest leverage is likely uh, to be uh, in the governor's spot, which I view as a operating role. Not, I've not got really no interest in being a, or not now, not ever, in being a representative or a senator. Uh, this is about uh, having a chance to actually run a business and help bring government into the 21st century, and and do what do what I've been doing in North Dakota for all these decades, which is you're trying to attract capital and talent to North Dakota to build high performing organizations, and that's what we're trying to do with the government in North Dakota. And. You had uh, accomplished a lot, and the North Dakota economy was booming coming into this year. Uh, describe the North Dakota economy um, in a nutshell for people who are not familiar with it. I think outsiders see the Bach and oil fields, and they see the, the wheat fields, and they don't know what else is there. What, what, what is the North Dakota economy now? Well, we, we really think that there's you know multiple legs on the stool, and of course, the one obvious one is uh, energy, all of the above, whether it's uh, whether it's wind uh, or oil and gas, uh, it doesn't matter. Our state is one of the leaders in energy, number two uh, oil and gas producing state behind Texas, uh, which has helped you know drive energy prices down, help create. Uh, energy security for the United States and probably you know, the US becoming energy independent, one of the biggest geopolitical changes in our lifetime. And that's been exciting because that's all been driven by technology, which has unlocked uh, resources that people thought previously were inaccessible. And of course, ag, we've always been an agriculture powerhouse. We not only, uh, as Jamie said, we are, we think it's pretty sweet that we're the number one producer of honey, uh, but we also lead the nation in 11 other crops. And, and so we think about our primary roles as powering the world and feeding the world. But in addition to that, there's a really thriving uh, tech sector in North Dakota that's working on a cutting edge uh, information and whether that's uh, Microsoft's significant campus, whether it's biotech companies on the global stage like Aldebaran or all the work that we're doing uh, here related to being a leader in unmanned aerial systems uh, and those applications to help, uh, help the environment, help public safety uh, and help help agriculture. I mean, there's so much uh, opportunity to integrate UAS uh, with energy, with agriculture, and really drive advancements in precision agriculture. And again, continue on that mission to help feed and power the world. Well, let's spend the remainder of our time um, before Jamie comes back in with some questions on the COVID crisis and uh, what you've done. Um, we'll talk about this national experiment we're having in the revival of federalism because we're seeing 50 experiments taking place and and we'll find out which states had the right formula and which ones didn't and then maybe how um, the post-COVID economy is going to shift where technology companies choose to be but um, you um, you've taken a very measured uh, approach to the, the crisis um, shutting down things you thought needed to be shut down, but also keeping, I think you said, 93% of the economy open. What, what, what drove your decisions? Well, Rich, from the start, uh, we tried to take a real common sense North Dakota approach. And uh, we really said, hey, let's get uh, ideology out of the room. Let's get the data into the room. Uh, let's approach with facts versus fear. And there are a lot of fear, uh, both at the beginning and throughout this thing that may have been driving decisions. Uh, it really helped have a you know understanding and background around uh, <clears throat> modeling and predictions because uh, I think we avoided uh, you know buying into uh, sort of cataclysmic end of world uh, type uh, scenarios and just said hey we want to we want to focus on on trying to reduce the transmissible moments and so the seven percent of jobs that were closed down for a few weeks were the ones where we had the highest highest amount of transmissible moments personal care business bars restaurants. Uh, kept everything else going. I mean, all of ag, all of construction, all of energy uh, in healthcare, uh, all of the elective surgeries kept going because we were really looking closely at the numbers and saying, can we, can we build up the capability we need around testing and contact tracing at the same time that we're only using a small teeny portion of our healthcare capacity? And we were able to manage, uh, manage all of that. And, and so it, it, this is uncharted territory. Uh, there's so much noise coming at leaders from uh, all ends of the spectrum uh, in that, you know, the political spectrum, the emotional spectrum, the ideological spectrum, uh, lots of information. So this is a time where uh, leaders have to really sift through all that noise and it's very loud noise. 
uh, get down to the signal and take the targeted measured steps. And I, I, again, I, we, we believe in North Dakota, a light touch from government and a strong uh, reliance on individual responsibility because in the end of the day, it's not what government says, it's what people do. They're gonna slow the spread and the people of North Dakota have been amazing through this whole thing. And credit goes to them for the good numbers that we've got in terms of uh, controlling the spread of the virus. Most of the criticisms that governors like you take for being more uh, pro-open than pro-shutdown uh, comes from uh, the, your oppositional party. But within your party, the libertarian branch is not particularly happy with your contact tracing measures. Perhaps it's because they don't know how you've approached it. But how, what's your answer to them? Well, I, I think that if you are like me and love freedom and love individual responsibility and all the things that our country stands for, all the things that our nation has fought for, the freedom and liberties we've fought for for centuries. Uh, absolutely, we've got to fight for that. And one of the ways that we keep our economy open uh, is that we're able to stop the spread of the virus, which is certainly deadly to elderly, elderly people with underlying health conditions. We see that across the nations as people are uh, you know, dying alone in long-term care facilities. Uh, you know, we have a responsibility to serve all, all citizens of the state, uh, you know, of all ages and of all uh, disabilities and all challenges. And so we take, that re we take that responsibility very seriously. And one of the ways that we can keep our economy open, uh, what we call the North Dakota Smart Restart, one way we can keep it open is to be leading in, in testing. We've moved up to being number two in the nation in per capita testing. Uh, because this invisible enemy, you can't stop it unless you know where it is. And so with effective targeted testing strategies, we're able to find it. And then once we find it, uh, you find someone who's positive, you want to know who they've been in contact with. And it's all voluntary in terms of how citizens participate, participate in contact tracing. But when they do share information about who they work with, who their loved ones are, then we're able to actually save lives uh, with that information. And then we can use uh, early on, we said we want to use a scalpel, not a sledgehammer in terms of, of uh, how, we, how we stay open, but now it's not even a scalpel. We want to use a needle. We want to be very precise about who we ask to stay home uh, for a period of time to avoid the spread, and we can only do that uh, if we've got really excellent capabilities around contact tracing and around testing. And so uh, our, our, our focal point for all the contact tracing, whether it's a if, whether it's cell phone applications or whether it's the work that our people are doing in phone banks, uh, talking to individuals, uh, public health officials, calling them, it's all centered around individual privacy. And we're absolutely, totally, 100% committed to privacy. And everything that we do on the phone apps is 100% anonymous. Uh, we don't need people's uh, addresses. We don't need their phone numbers. We don't need their email. Uh, we don't need them to buy a subscription. Uh, you know, they get assigned a 36-digit anonymous uh, ID number that they control and they have in their in their hands. Uh, and if they've come in contact with someone who's positive, we have an opportunity to notify them and we don't even know who we're notifying. So there is a role of technology that's going to help uh, our economy get back uh, going again. And I think in a very American way, in a very uh, libertarian way, if you will, we can do that because we, we know that part of the reason China is open is because of their use of technology. Uh, the U.S. is not going to go for that, but there's ways where we can balance uh, and protect privacy completely and still help our economy get going faster. Let's talk about the federalism aspect of this, whether, whether it was from good motivations or, or, or just other motivations. Um, the administration of the country has really left this in the hands of governors and thus we have 50 states all competing with each other. Um, more, you know, and we, we all get to watch this great experiment in federalism taking place. Um, you've done a, a terrific job and the ratings show it. Um, what, name a governor or two um, that you also think is doing a, a good job. I mean, do you, do you talk to your colleagues and share information? Absolutely, we do. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, there's a number of folks that I, I think have been uh, in the thick of it that are doing uh, have done outstanding work. You know, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, Larry Hogan in Maryland, they've been, you know, on the outskirts of that huge Northeast uh, outbreak. Uh, when I look across the Midwest, there's been great performances 
uh, from uh, you know from our, our neighbors in uh, you know Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, people doing great. And then and again, we have to work with our neighbors. And so, regardless of what party you're in, we've had great collaboration with both Montana and Minnesota, as well as South Dakota, in terms of how we're uh, addressing this. But I love the fact that. Uh, states have been able to drive. I mean, people forget that the fifth, you know, the states at the beginning of our country, it was the states, the 13 states created the federal government, not the other way around. Uh, and when we talk about, you know, 50, uh, you know, cauldrons of democracy, sometimes is how the states are described. I think you and I and people on this call, it's really 50 platforms of innovation. And each state has a way to, to innovate and learn and best practices from each other. And we know uh, whether it's geography, whether it's density, uh, whether it's socioeconomic, each of our states are very different and a one size fits all federal approach. Uh, what doesn't matter what it is, whether it's uh, approaches on, sometimes on healthcare or economic development or whatever, they, they, they don't work. Our, our economy is too complex, the country is too complex and, and uh, having states have uh, more flexibility uh, now during this, during this crisis and going forward will be great for the country and great for the recovery. Well, uh, a last question before I uh, bring Jamie back in, and that is, as you look forward uh, past the crisis point, and we're emerging from the crisis, but as you look even further down the line, how do you think the flow of capital and talent will have been affected by this and will be determined by how states are reacting? We saw a little glimpse of what might be going on when Elon Musk, you know, threatened to move to Texas. Now that he forced Alameda County and the state of California to the table and he got his way, but, but a lot of people who aren't named Elon Musk don't have that kind of leverage and they'll vote with their feet is my thesis. And so I, I begin to wonder whether the, the dominance of information technology in pockets like Silicon Valley and Seattle and Route 128 will distribute more evenly. If Silicon Valley and, and Se Seattle, certainly not Redmond, uh, are going away anytime soon. But on the margin, do you see technology companies, and, and of course, every company today is a technology company. The, the biggest opportunities we've talked about before is the intersection of the Adams world and the Bits world, which North Dakota does so well. But your thoughts on that, talent and capital, Will they reflow to different places now? Is that an opportunity for you? Well, it is, is an opportunity for North Dakota. And as I said in my opening remarks, I mean, this is a, something that I've been working on as an entrepreneur my entire career is how do you bring capital and talent to a place like North Dakota? Uh, this disruption uh, is also an opportunity for transformation. And I think you're going to see, we saw it in the population numbers pre COVID. You saw that population was declining in some of the states that were high, high regulation and high tax because capital is going to flow to the place where it's the most secure and achieves the highest return and talent uh, is often going to follow that capital. And so we saw that there was some movement happening. Uh, now, Jamie mentioned my you know, classmates from uh, Stanford GSV <laughs> and a number of them have been very successful venture capitalists, there's a whole slew of them in that time frame in the 1980s that got started. I uh, was on the call with them some recently and some of them said for the very first time in their life, they've made an investment in a company without actually visiting the company or meeting in person with the entrepreneurs. And we know that there were some uh, venture firms uh, in the Silicon Valley that basically had an unwritten rule that they would only invest if they could drive to the board meeting. They weren't going to, you know, spend time away from their kids or away from their homes. They wanted to drive to board meetings, not fly to them. Uh, in Arthur Ventures, which I co-founded uh, with my nephew, James Burgum, uh, over a decade ago, the, right on, our, on the website, it said, we'll invest anywhere outside of Silicon Valley. I mean, we were willing to get on a plane and willing to invest in those places, which weren't uh, considered core because we knew that th there was a spread of good ideas that was everywhere. Rich, Rich talked about this in one of his books uh, about, uh, you know, America and where good ideas are. So I think there's going to be a real shift and I think there's going to be a shift in, in how people think about the use of real estate because people are realizing corporations, universities, uh, all kinds of folks that never thought they could do without their building are realizing that the core asset they have is that they're is the people, and as we used to say at the beginning at Great Plains and at Microsoft, everything that we make and sell comes from the minds of our team members. And when people realize in this bits world that that asset is the is the people, 
uh, then in the melding of the bits and the, 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 the digital world, that's as the case for sure. And so anyway, I, I think there's going to be a shift and I think it's going to accelerate. That's Maybe. perfect, uh, Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. We have some fantastic uh, um, uh, questions here and I'd like to curate through them. Um, one of your ex Stanford colleagues, Paul Barber, sends his regards and says, please compare running a public company with being governor of a state. Well, compare and contrast. Well, Paul, good to hear from you. And, and, uh, and I'd say there actually are some, uh, some parallels. Uh, it was interestingly the misperceptions that people in government have of CEOs, particularly of tech CEOs, because there may be people have watched too many movies and they think that a CEO in the private sector uh, you know, sits in a tower and, and makes all the decisions. I mean, maybe that was the case 120 years ago when capital was king and labor had no power. But in a world where if you're a tech CEO and your, your talent on the front lines, the actual developers are some of your most important assets, then you, you work for them. As the CEO, you work for the people that work for you. You are doing everything you can to get obstacles out of their way, uh, get them the environment, get them the information, get them the, uh, the, the resources they need to be successful. And, and in that metaphor, being a tech CEO, uh, being a servant leader, if you will, for the people that you work for is a great parallel uh, to government. The thing that is a kind of a candy store of opportunity coming from the tech world is, is government in general is somewhere between 10 and 20 years behind of the private sector, uh, and not because there aren't good, well-meaning people, it's because many of the things that government does, uh, if it's a driver's license, a fishing license, if it's a, uh, you know, some, you know, a state park, if it's a, a tax department, there's no competition for that, and competition is always what, in the market, which drives people to enhance, improve, and in, improve their services, and I think, again, one of the things that we're going to see across states all over the country is when they've had to, uh, you know, when you've had to close, say, your, you know, the classic example, you've got to close your DMV office and people don't get an opportunity to come and literally take a number and sit in the lobby for two or three hours to take a driver's test. Uh, you know, having that be gone, that's one of, going to be one of the happy things about COVID because we're going to realize there's so many things that can be done digitally and online uh, that don't require uh, a physical person behind the counter and don't require a citizen to leave their work day to come and spend hours to do a transaction which should be able to done, be done in seconds. And I really think we've got to look to the tech world. I, I've challenged our state pre-COVID, challenged all of our agencies, said, look, the consumer understands two interfaces, the Apple App Store and Amazon uh, Prime. And if our, if our experiences don't match those when we're dealing with citizens, they're always going to be comparing us unfavorably to their experience. The challenge is the big five spend over $70 billion a year in R&D, and most states have no budget for doing any R&D relative to digitization. But I think that, again, uh, there you know, some of the dollars that are coming uh, from the federal relief, we're applying towards the digitization of government because this is a way we can reduce transmissible moments. And so it's a win-win. We solve a health problem and we improve a, uh, we help move <laughs> government into the digital economy. Okay. Um Thank you. Um, and so there've been a lot of compliments I've received here and uh, related to your response to COVID with the uh, testing uh, and the uh, procedures. I flashed them on the screen while you and Rich were talking. Um, one of the questions was, have, is there much sharing going on between the states and best practices and how relevant is what you're doing to a large state like California or New York with large populations in an urban environment? Well, yes, there's quite a bit of sharing, and I'd say the sharing is going on, uh, you know, primarily through governors associations. Uh, the National Governor Association, which is a bipartisan group, has been uh, been uh, very active in sending out almost daily updates of best practices across states. Uh, and then, of course, uh, each of us, uh, the two parties, have got associations. Uh, I found great value in connecting with uh, Republican governors uh, from across the nation uh, who are doing uh, it's oftentimes incredible work and there's very open sharing there. And then just informally within regions, uh, you're seeing governors talking to their neighbors uh, perhaps more than they ever have before. And, and this is also really important because you know many of us like with uh, North Dakota of Minnesota, we've got shared metro areas across the border and it's very helpful if we're, we're collaborating in terms of how we're, we're approaching because the virus doesn't, uh, doesn't yeah. understand 
the calendar and the virus doesn't understand uh, that the borders exist. And so when you've got those shared metro areas, collaboration is essential. Okay, that's great. Now there's another interesting question here from um, an investor in Zurich. And there, it's a long question, but I'll distill it down. The, the, the comment really is, is that the media in the United States seems to have incredible power to influence policy making and scare um, decision makers into taking more defensive uh, postures than maybe what makes sense. In, in North Dakota, are you as influenced by the national media as you would be in a major media hub like New York or San Francisco? Or do you have more, or do you have more freedom to you know, make more deliberate choices? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, early on, uh, we, we could kind of see there that was going. And of course, uh, whether it's uh, uh, national news channels, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, CNN or the, the reach of uh, New York Times or Washington Post, they reach across the whole country. And I think, you know, in North Dakota early on, we, we said, look, uh, you know, if the, na if the national news is reporting on a, uh, you know, hurricane in Florida, that's one thing. But if you want to find out what's going on on a spring flood in North Dakota, you better check your local paper uh, to find out, you know, if the river next to your house is going to flood or not, because that's not going to be in the national news. And so we really tried to set a tone early on uh, that, that people should be, uh, you know, pursuing local trusted news sources uh, to get information about North Dakota because uh, some of the uh, situation that was going on, whether it was in Italy or whether it was going on in, uh, you know, the northeastern part of the United States, that did not apply uh, to the U.S. or I mean, that didn't apply to North Dakota and it certainly didn't apply to the rural parts of North Dakota. So we, we, we tried to grab uh, the narrative early on and this narrative of facts, not fear. And, and we've, uh, I think we've been, again, we're blessed that so many people in North Dakota are, have been North Dakota smart and they're really paying attention to yeah. North Dakota news. Yeah, so you control the narrative. That's a very interesting point. I, I appreciate the, <clears throat> your answer. And the, again, also the question from Zurich. Well, I think uh, one there's a series of questions about, all right, North Dakota, 600,000 people, you know, uh, two senators. We have more felons in California than North Dakota has voters. <laughs> you know, so what's, uh, how, how apropos are the lessons and what's really been the impact on the state budget in North Dakota versus what we're seeing in uh, California, where we have a big, you know, 30, 40 billion dollar hole in the budget? You said something where seven percent of the workforce was kept away. You know, so what? You know, kind of where? You know, what what drives the budget in North Dakota? How is it being impacted? And you know, how how, how do you feel about federal kind of support to states that may be more impacted? Well, Jamie, I'm, since every North Dakota council, I want to make sure that we everybody knows we have seven hundred sixty thousand people. Okay, on. all right, that's that's uh, that's like twenty percent more. <laughs> But uh, we're, uh, I think the lessons actually uh, are, do apply because the decisions that we're making and executing in a state like ours, uh, just as much thought, just as much energy, uh, just as much communication uh, goes in. It's just, you know, what, what's the audience that's, that's going out? And so I think that uh, policies that here absolutely are applicable uh, to, to larger states. In terms of the economic impact on the budget, yeah, we've been affected, but we were affected first by the 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 demand shock, particularly to oil and gas, uh, because there, you know, we saw gasoline consumption drop to the levels of the 1960s. I mean, that wasn't in anybody's model. We saw, you know, we saw at the last, uh, you know, last month at the end of the trading contract for the first time since 1983, 9X on an oil future traded negative. People were paying on the last yeah. hours, the last day, $37 they were paying $37 to get rid of a barrel of oil, not to buy a barrel of oil. And so that was, again, some unheard of things. I mean, I guess when people talk about black swans, it was like we had a flock of black swans, you know, landing around that. And so that, that's affected our budget. But North Dakota, knowing uh, th that we are a state that is dependent on prices we can't control in ag and energy, we have one of the largest budget stabilization funds in the country by percentage of budget is 15% of our general fund. We've got tucked away in a savings account. So we've got that much cushion. Uh, 15 right or 50 or five zero? One, one five. One, one five. five. Yeah. We've got 15%. So we could have a 15% drop in revenue and still have it covered with what we've got in cash, you know, on hand in a budget stabilization fund. 
Uh, and, and one of the things, of course, we, we did see is that, that during the month of March, uh, our sales tax held up. People you know, may have not stopped shopping in, in some stores, big box retail went up, online sales went up, sales tax is a big driver for our state. And again, when we keep, you know, keep everybody working, that's great. And then you, you throw in all of this unprecedented amount of stimulus money. Uh, North Dakota, because we're the only state in the nation that has a state-owned bank that works really closely with our community banks, there's been national stories talking about how we won the sweepstakes on the, the payroll protection plan on a per capita basis. We had more businesses uh, than any other state. I think close to 15,000 businesses uh, capturing uh, $1.8 billion of, of the PPP plan. Wow. Uh, that in. So there's a, that we were able to, again, mobilize quickly uh, and nimbly and access some of those federal stimulus dollars. And I'm not a guy that, that is, believes in federal stimulus dollars, but this is an unusual time because it's the first time in the history of the state of North Dakota that, that the, the state has ever asked businesses to shut. Uh, you know, that's an unusual thing. And so I feel we've got an extra responsibility to help out, particularly those businesses that we asked to close. So okay. I, I'd say we're, we're, in, we're in good shape. I, I know that people, people that have tough budget situations going yeah. in are hoping that they're going to get a big federal bailout. But I'm not sure that we should, you know, saddle our grandkids with the, with the you know, trillions of dollars of additional debt uh, for, for states that may have been in a poor financial situation before this started. Okay, and a final question from our mutual friend, Steve Case, who sends his regards. How is Fargo developing as a startup city? Well, how fun to hear from Steve. And uh, Steve and Gene actually uh, on a uh, quiet road trip, they were taking driving an RV, the two of them across the country stopped in uh, Fargo uh, last uh, August. And I want to say thanks to them for doing that. Uh, and thanks, uh, Steve is really someone who's shown a light on cities outside of Silicon Valley, both with his his uh, uh, his his venture investing and with his uh, bully pulpit that he has. And so I want to thank him for for doing that. But uh, Fargo has been uh, been incredible. Of course, with the Microsoft presence there after the acquisition, uh, it'll be this next year will be the 20th anniversary of that. The Microsoft presence has grown now to several thousand people in Fargo. Uh, there's been uh, close to 30, somewhere between 30 and 40 spinoffs and startups that are going there. Uh, and there's uh, things that are happening there with precision agriculture. There's a new, uh, a new thing that just got launched uh, that Microsoft is involved in called Grand Farm, which matches our Grand Sky. Grand Sky was our, our private public uh, aerospace tech, uh, tech park uh, where we're leading the nation in beyond visual line of sight UAS. Well, now Grand Farm is going to be the leader in really using technology to develop uh, fully automated precision farming. And we've got uh, plug and play. We've got Microsoft. We've got companies coming uh, literally from all over the world that want to use this again as a uh, incubator uh, for us to advance new technologies. And as, as Rich says so well, uh, to take that Adams world and the BITS world, bring them together uh, and do that across energy and ag and apply technology. So uh, Steve is right on. Fargo's a very, very incredibly vibrant city. It's been voted as uh, the best number one. You had number one for millennials. Fargo's have been on a, a dozen top 10 lists, including best places for uh, college students to think about starting businesses. Well, that's terrific. Well, we got many, many compliments coming in, uh, Governor, and um, you have offers from four different states to go be governors there after your term out in four years' time. And Rich, we got a very nice compliment on you, too, that they read 2.0, your book, and uh, Life 2.0, and got out of the insurance business and got into something that he's much happier. So he wants to give you a belated thank you. So, <laughs> well, oh, good. Thank you, <laughs> Governor. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we, thanks so much, uh, Governor Burgum. Yeah. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Jamie. Perfect. And thank, thanks everybody that was watching. Uh, and, uh, for, and for other friends on the line I didn't get a chance to hear from directly, thank you all. And, uh, and again, appreciate all the support you've been sending uh, towards North Dakota. Yeah, good. All right. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. And uh, for the rest of you, we hope to see you back in two weeks on, uh, on the 10th of um, June with our next program. But Governor, we look forward to seeing you. Hopefully we'll come visit you in Fargo before too long. All the best. Bye-bye.